بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Azam Allah ujurana wa ujurakum bin Saba Aba Abdullah al Hussein. May Allah amplify your and our reward in the grieving for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I beg you, Shimmer, don't sever his head. Bring your sword to me and take mine instead. He sits on his chest and watches Zainab run. Beside her brother, no brothers and no one. Is there any help to me? No, there is none. In her hopelessness, to her brother she fled. She screams to Shimmer, leave my brother alone. The arrows cutting him for his pain atone. The cuts on his body have reached his bone. And the dust weeps for holding the blood he's bled. Leave him, al leave him alone. Maybe he'll awa reawaken. You sit on his chest whilst his back is broken. His eyes watch Zainab by her grief stricken. He watches her as he severs Hussein's head. She sits by him, massacred by his absence. His body is here, but where is his presence? Everything is broken except his silence, and nothing was left of him unless it bled. She screams as if her soul from her body leaps. My brother in a river of his bloody sleeps. She slaps her head so hard that for her he weeps, as if he severed, as if his severed head towards a spear is led. O oh head I once adored in awe of its height. O oh head that once em embarrassed the moon's night. O oh head, not only are your girls left in fright, they see your head placed on a spear drenched blood red, as if massacring you wasn't enough, and neither was tearing these girls' hearts in half. We watch the spear that holds your holy head high, so today's grief would match yesterday's bloodshed. My eyes scarred by seeing your head on a spear. The tears I cry are blood, tortures me each tear. I see the lion that other lions fear, with a severed neck into a spear and bed. If you don't care for him, care for his children. At least let this head from their eyes be hidden. You torment the little hearts of each orphan. Tell them to Shimmer's sword, Hussein was fed. They killed her brother and left him with no shroud. They raised their, his head and raised it as if they're proud, taking his women captive before a crowd, and curse his father as to Yazid they head. O oh, grandfather, two of him were torn apart. O oh, grandfather, his head from body they'd, uh, they'd part. O oh, grandfather, nothing would have soothed his heart Accept your kiss upon his holy forehead. O oh, grandfather, killed with no one beside him. He looked to the distance and saw only them. The silence of the wind sang a painful hymn, telling him you're alone and alone you tread. If my father knows just how we are tre treated, how is a spear with my brother's head weighted? Indeed, the sword my brother's blood defeated. 
but we're left to fight this sword's vengeance and dread. O lion of battle, to which battle crawls, O catcher of the flag, if ever it falls, we're left paraded in Yazid's courts and halls. Through torture, death, and pain, these women I've led. After they steal his head as they wail, they take her captive, and his Zainab they steal, leaving in her a wound only he could heal. After they killed him, her brother they behead. Brother Hussein al Fahdawi will start us off with a recitation from the Holy Quran. Let us welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillahi <laughs> هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ظلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا بئس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآيات الله والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين قل يا أيها الذين آدوا زعمتم أنكم أولياء لله من دون الناس فتمنوا الموت فتمنوا الموت إن كنتم صادقين ولا يتمنونه أبدا بما قدمت أيديهم والله عليم بالظالمين قل إن الموت الذي تفرون منه فإنه ملاقيكم ثم تردون إلى عالم الغيب والشهادة فينبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا نودي للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فاسعوا إلى ذكر الله فاسعوا إلى ذكر الله وذروا البيع ذلكم خير لكم كنتم تعلمون فإذا قضيت الصلاة فانتشروا في الأرض وابتوا من فضل الله واذكروا الله كثيرا لعلكم تفلحون وإذا رأوا تجارة أو لهوا فضوا إليها وتركوك قائما قل ما عند الله خير من اللهو ومن التجارة والله خير الرازقين صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد 
وإذا البحار فجرت وإذا القبور بحثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جحيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها بغائبين وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا ولا أمر يومئذ لله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Thank you brother Sanjan beautiful recitations all around masha Allah we would like now to invite brother Hussein al Asadi to recite some reminders of the day of Ashura for us in Arabic let us welcome him with a heartfelt salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Sallallahu alayka ya Mawlaya ya Aba Abdillah Sallallahu alayka ya Ibn Rasulillah Gharib ya كربلاء يا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من التجأ إليكم فستم ويا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء وقل الفداء يا مسلوب العمامة والرداء يا ليلة العشر طولي طولي قد زاد فيك نحولي وددت من قبل قومي يحين وقت رحيل كربلاء كربلاء يعني ركض فوق الترى كربلاء يعني مصاب بصف مصاب كربلاء 
كربلاء يعني ألم يقطع الروح كربلاء كربلاء جروح جروح بس جروح كربلاء كربلاء يعني مرتك لو تنوح كربلاء يعني بل يم كربلاء يعني يعني جريح بصف جريح كربلاء كربلاء يعني زينب بتعلي تقوم وتطيح كربلاء يعني زينب بتعلي زينب زينب بتعلي تقوم وتطيح كربلاء يعني طفل خايف هواي إلوذ بكتر أمه ومشدوها راي كربلاء يعني عبد الله الرضيع يريد ما لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين في هذه الليلة في مخيم الحسين كان أبو عبد الله يودع بناته وأولاده وإخوته وأنصاره ويوصي زينب بوصايا نصيب الرثاء ارتفع هذه الليالي والله اليوم يا اخوة يا اخواتي ابوي طلع من البيت وترك التليفون واحنا نخابر على التليفون لكن ما جاوبه علينا فلو تشوف حالنا بالله ما نعرف شو نسوي لكن كيف هون علينا مصاب ابي عبد الله الحسين انهم كانوا يعلمون انهم ذاهبين الى الشهادة واحنا ابونا رجع سالم غانم لكن الحسين لم يعد الى بيته. حادثه من حوادث كربلاء هي مقتل عبد الله الرضيع طفل تقول الروايات انه كان عمره يبلغ سته اشهر وما بين ذلك اكثر الروايات تقول سته اشهر أضر به العطش أخذه أبوه الحسين إلى القوم قال يا قوم إذا كان للكبار ذنب فما ذنب الصغار يا قوم إن كنتم لا تريدون أن تشربوني من ماء الفرات فخذوا هذا الطفل واسقوه انقسم الجمع إلى قسمين قسم يقول اسقوا هذا الطفل وقسم آخر يقول لا لا تسقوه اتركوه اتركوه يموت عطشا صارت هناك جلبة ونزاع في صفوف ذلك الجيش الذي خرج لقتال أبي عبد الله الحسين فصاح عمر بن سعد حرملة ويحك اقطع نزاع القوم فأخذ حرملة ابن كاهل الأسدي بسهم ذي ثلاث شعب وجعل ينتظر الفرصة المواتية لكي يضرب ذلك الطفل الرضيع وما هي إلا لحظات حتى هبت نسمة هواء أزاحت القماش ذلك القماط الذي كان الطفل ملفوفا به ورمى ذلك السهم فسقط في نحر الرضيع فوضع الإمام الحسين يده تحت الدم وألقى به إلى السماء وقال إلهي إن كان هذا يرضيك فخذ حتى ترضى تحير الحسين يريد أن يعود إلى الخيام ولكن لا يريد أم الطفل أن ترى ولده وولدها مذبوحا من الوريد إلى الوريد 
فقد أخرج يده من طماطه من حرارة السهم فذهب إلى المخيم ووضع الطفل تحت ردائه جاءت له سكينة أخت عبد الله الرضيع قالت أبي أخذت أخي عبد الله وقد كان يبكي من شدة العطش هل جلبت الماء هل رويته فلم يقل لها الحسين شيئا ولكنه أخرجه من تحت عباءته فرأته ولم تت ولم تستطع أن تنظر إليه طويلا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم فقال لها نادي عمتك أم المصائب زينة فجاءت زينة لم تخبرها سكينة بما حدث فوقفت عند الحسين أبا عبد الله أنا قلبي مكسور أنا لا أتحمل مصيبة أخرى أبا عبد الله نور عيني ما وراءك قال أخيه خذ الطفل عني أخيه أعطيه إلى أمه أخذ الزين بذلك الطفل وذهبت به وضعته تحت عباءتها حتى جاءت إلى أمه قالت اجلسي يا ليلى فجلست قالت ليلى أين هو علي الأكبر قال استشهد قالت ماذا فعلت أمه قالت هي صابرة محتسب قالت أين هو القاسم قال استش... قالت استشهد قالت وما فعلت أمه قالت صابرة محتسبة قالت هذا ولدك ذبيح من الوريد إلى الوريد فاصبري واحتسبي أخذت الطفل لم تستطع أن تنظر إليه طويلا قالت يا زينب يا زينب عن الطفل نحيه نحيه يا زينب انا مالي 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 عين صدني تقول الروايه عندما رمى حرمله عبد الله بسهمه رفع يده الإمام الحسين إلى السماء وقال اللهم فرقهم قددا وأحصهم عددا ولا ترض الولاة عنهم أبدا اللهم إنهم دعونا لينصرونا ثم عدوا علينا ليقاتلونا وبعد ذلك بعد فترة قصيرة من الزمن استطاع الحجاج ابن يوسف الثقفي أن يسيطر على الكوفة وعلى وعلى الاقتصاص من 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 كل من شارك في قتل آل بيت رسول الله ومنهم كان حرمل ابن كاهل الأسدي فقال له الحجاج ابن يوسف الثقفي يا حرملة لقد كنت أبحث عنك طويلا اختبأ حرملة هرب جبان فقال يا حرملة ماذا فعلت في يوم العاشر من عاشوراء ماذا فعلت بآل رسول الله كل من يأتي من المدينة يسألني يقول آل بيت رسول الله يسألون هل ظفر الحجاج بحرمل بن كاهل الأسدي ماذا فعلت أنت في ذلك اليوم أخبرني إني قاتلك لا محالة أخبرتني إني قاتلك إن لم تخبرني إني قاتلك قال أنا قائل لك ما فعلت رميت سبع سهام أصبت ثلاثة وأخطيت وأخطأت في أربعة أما السهم الأول فكان في عين أبي الفضل العباس وأما السهم الثاني فكان عندما رمى عندما رمي الحسين عليه السلام بحجر فشج جبينه فأخذ ثوبه ليمسح الدم عن جبينه فانكشف لي عن درعه فضربته في كبده وأما السهم الثالث فكان لعبد الله الرضيع وكأني بأم الرضيع 
وهي جالسة إلى جنب ولدها وهي تقول يا عيني لا تسهرين نامي الليالي جائي المني تبارين فاقيد الغالي عبد الله جاني وراح والمهد خالي وتغير ومردوه من عقب حالي روحي نوحي هان الرباب الفاقد وليدي ورضيعه بدم وريد مخضب فاطلب رضيعه يا الله بالحسين الوجيء وأمه وأبيه وجده وأخيه والتسعة المعصومين من بنيه يا الله فرج لنا فرج لنا يا الله فرجا قريبا عاجلا كلمح البصر أو هو أقرب من ذلك بمحمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين اللهم لا تجعلنا دينا إلا سددته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا غائبا إلا أعدته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات شيعة أمير المؤمنين رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Thank you, Brother Hussain, for that sorrowful reminder. <coughs> Ruqayya, or Sakina, was the daughter, the youngest daughter of Imam Hussain. She was said to be four years of age at the time of the massacre. The name Sakina refers to calmness or peace of mind, and Imam Hussain often was heard saying that a house without Sakina would not be worth living in. Sakina was the apple of her uncle Abbas's eye. In Medina, he would often come and check on her and she would go over to Umm al-Banin's house to check on him. And during the journey to Karbala, he would rise above to check on her well-being. <coughs> she was also the pride of her father, and every night she would place her head on his chest in order to fall asleep. And it wasn't until she fell asleep that Rabab, her mom, would remove her and put her to bed. But on the second day of Muharram, Imam Hussain alayhi salam advised Rabab to stop this so that Sakina would get used to falling asleep by other means. In Damascus, when they were in prison after they'd been through what they'd gone through she stopped asking for water because she learned that she can live with thirst and Rabab would have to offer her water and through a small window in the prison Next to her aunt Zainab, they saw a flock of, of migrating birds. And as an as a innocent four-year-old, 
she asked her aunt Zainab, will we ever get to go home like these birds do? A few short weeks later in Damascus, in the prison, Imam Zain al-Abideen found Ruqayya cold on the floor. She had passed away. And so Ruqayya was laid to rest in that prison. <laughs> Sayyida Zainab held her in her arms and Imam Zain al-Abideen dug a grave in that prison cell and that is where she lay. When Rabab was released from prison, she came to the grave and she placed her cheek on the grave and she cried, speak to me Sakina, only one word my child, speak to me. Sakina did not live long enough to be as old as our wonderful youth speakers, but she has taught us much. We are delighted to be joined by our youth speaker tonight, Maryam Al Ansari, who will be speaking to us about the bridge to Allah. Let us welcome her with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah, 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 وطبيب قلوبنا وحبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحمل وحملناه في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير مما خلقنا تفضيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله This was a verse from Surah Al-Isra chapter 15 ayah 70 Indeed we have honored the children of Adam and we carry them in the land and on the sea and have made provisions of good things for them and exalted them a high degree over many whom we have created. Guess what? We're human. And you know, that means that we're Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's most beloved creations. He loves us. But as humans alone, as much as we try, we cannot reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and we are not. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot come down to us and become imperfect as our brothers the Christians believe because this goes against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfect nature. So as you can see already there is a separation between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we love somebody that we cannot associate with? I mean for those that do psychology here, you know that the factors of, of that influence attraction are similarity, proximity, and familiarity. If he is perfect and we're imperfect, it's hard to find commonality. If he is an alim and ilahiya and we're in this material world, then there is a great distance between us. And if we cannot see her or feel him, how can we become familiar with him? SubhanAllah, 
He knows that this is what we're thinking, and so he solved these problems for us. He established for us a bridge directly from the lowest realm of existence to the highest pos position imaginable. This bridge is Islam. It's a bridge from this life to the reality. By following Islam, we can, we can get to the greatest status to him, the status of being the neighbors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd like to delve slightly into this concept of neighborhood. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited by space. So by getting closer, we are enclosing him with a space by saying that he's a point B that we should reach on our journey. Therefore, we're stating independence from him and we're saying that there's a distance between us. In the Quran though, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Therefore, we understand that this distance is not a physical separation. It's a distance from understanding the truth and not actual distance from the truth, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd like to give an example of a blind man. When you say ocean, he would not know how it looks like, but he'll imagine it and he'll give it an image based on his other senses, such as his smell, taste, and touch. He may believe that he has acquired all the knowledge he needs about the ocean, but this is not the reality. It is according to his own perspective. But if he is given sight, it is according, <coughs> if he is given sight, he sees reality, and this knowledge has been actualized in the blind man. And he's entered a new realm of understanding about the ocean. Similarly, we must open our insight to Allah, to the reality of creation. For we are from him, as he says, We blew to mankind from our soul. We are a fraction of his manifestation. فَمَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who knows himself, he'll know his Lord. Why? Because we're in effect to his cause. We are dependent on him. We are not an independent creation as much of us are led to believe. He is the sun and we are the shadows or the rays that are made from the sun. And without the sun, this shadow would not exist. It is dependent on the sun to exist. And if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's manifestation of his attributes, al khaliq al musawwir al rauf al rahim we would not exist. This leads us to come to a conclusion that he is eternal and we are not. We exist because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, because his attributes exist. There was no start or end to the creation because he will ever exist and his attributes will always exist. There can be no change in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there can be a change in us. We can change due to his manifestation of mercy as he has given us free will. So here we are in a temporary realm made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmat for us to use this free will he's given us. He made this realm so that we may be able to know him bit by bit so that we don't burn when we are exposed to his reality. This concept is hard to grasp, so I'll give you an example. An example of a person and a light. This light is very, very bright. That if you look at it, it will blind you. But everything else that you see in the room is because of this light, so you need it. Slowly, you start looking towards the light. You let your eyes adjust, and then you keep doing this process again until you reach a stage where you're nearly looking at the light. But still, you cannot look at the light because it will hurt your eyes. This is like us now with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turned us away so that we don't get hurt. 
and we can choose whether to start turning ourselves toward him again in this life. But once we decide not to, and our time in this temporary realm is over, we are forced to turn and look at this, and this will burn. This is hellfire that we have prepared for ourselves, brothers and sisters. We do not want to be in this situation. Yet, it's so hard to turn, so hard to follow the truth. Why? Because we don't understand it. What do we do, brothers and sisters? Simple. We manifest the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it mathematically. Let's say that those who have manifested the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the Prophet peace be upon him and Ahlul Bayt, they have 100% and we are 100% alhamdulillah. The fraction would be 1 over 100. Now, let's say we add another 99% to this 1%. It becomes 100 over 100. And these cancel out to become one. We become as complete as a human can be. So, the more we manifest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes, the less we become disassociated with Him, and therefore the quicker we cancel out the minor dependent beings that we are, and we become the neighbors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is the manual or the guide to manifesting the attributes. He has sent to us a checklist of comprehension and a constant reminder, which is the Qur'an. And He has sent to us role models that have completed this journey, uh, completed this journey to show us how to conduct ourselves when we're taking this to Allah, the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the Ahlul Bayt. Both of these sides are encompassed by space and time. Therefore, they can exist at all ages in everybody's heart. Islam has been installed into every single person as an algebraic function of success. <coughs> it depends on us whether or not we use it. I mean, why shouldn't we when it's the easiest formula to use to solve our equation? So we must follow the infallibles of the Quran because these are the bases of the formula of Islam. But when we do this for ourselves, there's this I that gets in the way, and this can mislead us. And therefore, we should do this selflessly. And the best example of this is Imam Hussain He ignored his personal benefits to the greater benefits of all Muslims of all ages and all times. So another very important component of this formula is unity. Islam is a religion of the people and not of the individual. So thinking of isolating yourself in worship is not following the formula and will certainly won't get you to the truth. As Shaheed al-Mutahiri says, Al-Wa'i wal taharruq fil mujtama wa talaman wa tarabut bayn al-afrad I'm paraphrasing here, but basically he says that awakeness comes from a community and the relations between individuals. This comes from his book, Ahya al Fikr al Dini fi Islam, Reviving Religious Mentality in Islam. We have established the purpose of Islam and its eternal existence, but how do we revive this mentality? The Shaheed answers this too. He says, to revive the Muslim mentality, it is a collective commemorating of our historical revolutions and acts of jihad. And look at us here today, brothers and sisters. We are here commemorating the sacrifice of our third Imam. An Imam that put his life, his family, and his material belongings down so that he may show us how to cross this bridge. He was martyred so that we may trust this bridge and slowly crawl across it after him. We needed Karbala, for without it, we wouldn't be here, meaning that we couldn't help each other to revive the Muslim spirit. 
We need each other, brothers and sisters. Please, stay together and stay united. Ahsanti, thank you, Hajiya Maryam, for a very inspirational talk. We are now going to have a short intermission. May I ask the brothers and sisters to please move forward so that there is more space in the back. And please stay seated and the refresh refreshments will come to you. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Just five minutes. I'm 
Hurry up, I'm gonna restart. I'm gonna restart. صلوا على محمد وال محمد
poem I recite tonight is dedicated to Abdullah Radia, the son of Imam al Hussein. I was inspired to write this poem after listening to a couple of lines of Arabic poetry a couple of weeks ago. And the structure of the poem is as follows. I thought I'd highlight it just so that it um, makes it a bit easier to follow, just in case it gets a bit confusing. It's a story of someone telling um, their recollection of the first time they were introduced to Abdullah Rabi'a, coincidentally at the age of six months as well, for a majlis of Abu Abdullah Hussein. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I remember when I was a baby, I was introduced to Abdullah Radia. Let me tell you a story so maybe you can know Abdullah like how I know him. I was born six months ago, yet I have never been this thirsty. Reaching for my mother's breast to quench my thirst, although there was a time which she showed me no mercy. In unison, everyone was crying, while thirst afflicted my throat. My mother sobbing while I choke, she doesn't take note. Then I heard the reciter recite. He mentioned a child with small hands and cute feet, a face with warmth that makes one's heart beat. A beautiful baby like me, a baby bathed in mercy and love, similar to the feelings I get when onto my mother I hold. Yet there was something strange about this child, something you could feel without being told. Something that gives grief to the young, turning them old, something which caused tears to appear. So I close my eyes to listen to hear the voice that comes from these tears. I then reached for the breast again, but I was rejected with a loud cry. I heard the narrator narrate, Rabab submitted to fate. She carried the baby to a lady, a lady with the name Zainab. Angels begin to cry. Why do they drop their tears on the land? The baby's in safe hands, protected by Zainab, a lady whose protection is grand. The thirst is hurting my throat still, a pain that makes my lips and tongue ill. The reciter continues to recite. He mentioned the baby is now held by the hands of light, the hands of Hussein. When I heard that name, a spark of flame ignited my heart, but brought me pain. Oh, what a name. My heart starts to beat faster of my eyes and ears. I'm no longer the master for Confusion touched my soul. This baby is also thirsty. Do they not know that we feel thirst? I would quench the thirst myself, but I cannot walk. Few words I can mumble, but still I cannot talk yet. I call to the baby. To the fountains of life we should turn. To quench our pain. For what have we done to feel our throats burn? The crying ceases for a moment as if they deemed my call potent and the silence continues. What happened? I begin to think. I hear a murmur about the baby, people talking about getting him drink, and I hear Hussein's footsteps on the sand, treading towards the enemy land, and I want to go to Hussein and pull on his robe and ask, why do you take your child away from his mother? For no one other will show him love, no one other will care for him, as ordained by the Lord above. The reciter now says the child's name, Abdullah, the son of Hussein, of the child's pain I am aware. The burn of our throat is the pain that we share. Everything goes quiet as if people in prayer, yet they do not pray. They are discussing. One says we should give the baby water, what is his sin? The other says kill the baby in the hands of the Prophet's kin. I am confused while tears flood my cheeks and I listen closely. A new creation begins to cry, a cry of beauty, a cry of mercy, a cry of a grandmother. The reciter cannot recite anymore, choking on his tears, so an angel begins to recite. 
I reach once more for the breast, but instead I am met with tears. My mother's tears filled my mouth. I spit them out onto my hand, reaching for the skies, telling the angels to deliver these tears to satisfy Abdullah, the son of Hussein. What I heard next shook my soul. Silence the fitna and then called. Execute the baby and other roared in moments past. Hussein heard the baby cough a change in his breathing. The angel of death steps closer, eyes from his sorrow are bleeding. With blood on Hussein's hands he raises them pleading to the Lord of the worlds asking for meaning. Ab Abdullah then lifts his hands to his neck. The bird from the thirst and now the bird from the arrow trying to grab this arrow yet his hands fail to reach. His soul departs his body. Salaamu alaykum ya Hussain his speech. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Thank you. Out of Billah, him in a shaitan or regime. Bismillah, Rahman or Rahim. Cut a flahal moon, a lady in a home fee salat him hashaun, will lady in a home and love him or his own, will lady in a home is a cat to him fahilun, will lady in a home with Ruj him half a boon, illa ala as wajim, oh mamma, like at a man who fell in a home by Roman mean. فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون Successful indeed are the believers those who humble themselves in their prayers and who turn away from all that is frivolous and who are active in deeds of charity and who guard their modesty except from their wives or what the right hands possess, for then they are not blameworthy. But those whose desires exceed those limits and transgressors, and those who are faithful to their trusts and to their pledges, and those who guard their prayers, these will be their heirs, who will inherit paradise. There they will abide. Sadaqallah al azim We are grateful to be joined by our esteemed Speaker Haji Talib Shaheen for our main lecture and his topic is about the importance of prayer. Let us welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah wa Ali 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 Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. حبيب الله رب العالمين بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وأصحابه المنتجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أتل ما أوحي إليك من الكتاب وقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون صدق الله العلي العظيم مع دي رسبكت برادز وسستز السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته The ninth night of Muharram as we are coming to an end to these holy nights and this commemoration of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam we hope that insha'Allah the lessons do not come to an end either 
Meaning that what we have learnt in these nights that have passed, we allow them to grow within us. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi has said, in the hearts of believers, there is a fire for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam that will not be extinguished. So that fire that's not extinguished, it's not about just remembering Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for 10 days. It's not like the fire in the hearts of the believers will be there for 10 days, but rather it will not be extinguished. Therefore, we hope that the lessons that we learn in these holy nights are lessons that we implement within our, holy, within our lives wholeheartedly so that we may join the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And as we have spoken about previously in the previous talks about the definition of taqwa and the sifat of al-muttaqeen, the characteristics of al-muttaqeen, today I want to cover another topic regarding the muttaqeen and something and a topic that we all must pay great attention to and that is the topic of salah for there are about 1 point some 1.5 billion muslims in the world right now and counting inshallah and growing it's a big family and if you were to go to every single muslim household you would find that within this household there are members who pray and this prayer five times a day is a key part to the life of a muslim for we find a narration from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi afdal salatu salam where he says prayer is the pillar of religion and its likeness is a likeness of a pillar of a tent if the pillar of a tent is stably fixed the pegs and the rope remain stable but if the pillar inclines and breaks neither peg nor rope remains fixed so what the Imam is saying to us is this imagine your religion is like a tent Imagine your religion is like a tent and the middle of the tent, because when you build a tent, if any of you have ever gone camping, on those big tents they have the pole in the middle. And if there's no pole in the middle, what will happen to the tent? It will collapse. The same thing with your religion. With your deen. One of the pillars of your deen is a salah. And if you do not uphold salah correctly, or if salah does not play a big role in your life, then that religion or that tent that is your deen will collapse without a doubt. But unfortunately in today's world, when it comes to Salah, we have a lack of understanding regarding Salah. I mean, if we were to truly understand what Salah is all about, and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to us through the Ahlul Bayt salam, that on the Day of Judgment, if your Salah is not accepted, then the rest of your deeds will not be accounted for. But unfortunately today, and I think I speak for myself before I speak for anybody else, that our salah has become like a ritual. Meaning what? That we know that five times a day, right? Or five prayers a day rather, because the Quran stipulates three times a day for prayer. So we know that our five prayers a day. Do we uphold these prayers? How do we pray these prayers? Do we pray them like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran like the hypocrites? Or do we pray them as the sister mentioned in her introduction, like Al Mu'minun, Al Ladina Mufi Salatihim, Because when it comes to our salah, either we pray like the hypocrites, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says in Surah Al Nisa, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna al Munafiqina Khadi'un Allah, Wallah Khadi'un, If Qamu ila Salati Qamu Kusal, Yirawun al Nas, Wala Yuthkurun Allah illa Qalila. Allah is saying they're hypocrites. When they stand up for salah, they stand up kusala. What's that mean? It means sluggish, you know, like you can't move and like you're about 90 years old. And I swear sometimes you see some 90 year olds, some old people praying. They can't bend over and they make sure they have something so they can prostrate, for example, on a table. And they still have that khushu in their salah. But some of us, we are young, we are full of energy. And we get up for salah like it's the biggest burden of our life. Well, on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us right at the start of Surah Al-Mu'minun, He says to us that if you are a believer, you'll have this khushu and salah. But in order for us to attain a level of khushu and salah, we need to understand salah. We need to understand what salah is. What is the origin of salah as in the term? <coughs> what does it really mean? And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us within the Holy Quran are the benefits of salah. Because when we look in the Holy Quran, 
The Salah is mentioned in so many different ways. What do I mean by that? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions for us the different benefits when it comes to Salah. So inshallah, we're going to look today at the concept of Salah in Islam, considering now that we have established that it is really important. It's important to the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he has said that Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa He has said that everything has a face. You have a face, I have a face, everything has a face. And the face of your religion is Salah. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, how do we take care of the face of our religion? Because I mean, certainly before we go out anywhere in the world today, we make sure that our face, you know, that you fix your beard for the brothers, you know, the sisters have fixed their hijab, right? Because our sisters, you know, makeup is not allowed to be worn outside the house, right? Inshallah. And, you know, we make sure we look presentable, we don't look like a, you know, like ridiculous, like a hooligan or something, right? So we take care of our appearance. The same way, on the Day of Judgment, our religion, the face of our religion will be Salah. As we know, if that is not accepted, then none of our deeds are accepted. So, let us have a look at the word Salah. Now, the word Salah, many people will ask, or they come and say, there are a few opinions of where the root word actually derives from. Some will say the root word comes from a Tasalah, so connection. But there is another opinion regarding the root word of Salah. Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, one of the opinions regarding the root word of Salah, it comes from the same letters of another word, which is Yasla. Okay, so what am I talking about here? I'll give you an example from the Holy Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. Ma aghna anhu ma lahu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran dhata. Sayasla naran dhata. Now this word here, let me give you another example from the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بِتُونُهُمْ نَارٌ سَيَسْلَوْنَهَا سَعِيرًا Okay. Now what does this word here, Yasla mean? It means burn. Now you're thinking, what does burning have to do with Salah? And this is beautiful, brothers and sisters. Burning is that when this root word that Salah comes from, to burn what? It is to burn any diseases within yourself. It is to burn any sins that you have. It is to burn any barriers between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell me, when you understand Salah like this, don't you want to pray to burn anything between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Think about it. Even, for example, for example, because then we say, for example, عن الإمام الباقر أو الإمام الصادق عليهم أفضل الله الصلاة والسلام أثقل ما وضع في الميزان يوم القيامة الصلاة على محمد وعلى آل بيته. Wow, ما صلي على محمد وعلى. So it said that the most heaviest of things that will be brought to the scale on the day of judgment is the صلاة على محمد وعلى محمد. So why is this? Ahsad, I think when Haji Sahaba said yesterday we're doing a count of the salawat, everyone is very enthusiastic. One more time, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I think you're going to be happy when you realize what this means now. So, when we say in the Quran, إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما. اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد. ما شاء الله. What a reward happening tonight. So when we say when Allah سبحانه وتعالى tells in the Quran that Allah and His angels they send salutations onto the Prophet and the believers send your salutations onto Muhammad onto the Prophet Muhammad. What does this mean? If we said that Salah comes from the root word Dafa, which means to burn, that means when you send Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, you are burning any barriers between you connecting with Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So that we see that this Salah that we talk about, this connection, this salutation, what is it about this Salah when you go every day to do your five daily prayers? What is it about? It's about destroying any barrier between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. That you get rid of the sins within you, you burn them away, you burn the illnesses within you. Because Salah has all of these aspects. 
Because Fatima the Zahra Salamullah alayha said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he prescribe Salah? To get rid of al kibr to get rid of arrogance, to destroy illnesses. So let us look now within the Holy Quran as to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said about Salah. So he says, in Surah Al Ankabut, verse number 45, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Wa atlu ma uhiya ilayka min al kitabi, wa aqimma al salata inna al salata tanha an al fahshai wal munka. Okay. We're talking about burning these sins. Right? When you pray, you burn these sins, you burn these illnesses, because your salah is you trying to get closer in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, let's see, for example, how this Salah can do this. One day there is a story narrated by Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi, where he says that there is a man who one day he's traveling from an area in Iran to Karbala. So on his travel, he gets stopped by a bunch of thieves. When he gets stopped by these thieves, they're starting to rob him and the Sheikh is looking, are they robbing him? Then all of a sudden, they are banned for Salah goats. So the chief of the thieves, he stops and he prays. And the sheikh looks here, <laughs> he says to him, uh, look, you seem to be the chief of the thieves and you're robbing me, but why are you praying? So what did this thief say? He said, look, I know what I do is wrong. But as long as I keep that salah, that rope, that connection between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe one day it will change me. So, some years go by and this man is at one of the maqams, the sheikh, and he's sitting there. Then a man comes up to him. He looks like a very pious man. He has a nice beard. All of a sudden, he says to him, do you remember me? Uh, the sheikh looks at him and says, no, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. He says, do you remember so many years ago on so-and-so road, on the way to Karbala, you were robbed? He said, yes, he goes, I am that robber that was praying. We see that this salah, even even according to hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Rasulullah said with regards to a man who used to pray with him and yet commit sins verily his prayer will prevent him from sinning someday or other and very soon that man repented because you find that when a person wants to get nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, naturally, let's have a look at the epidemic or the issue with our youth today. Our youth today have this trend, right? And I'm sure we all have many friends or we've been through this ourselves. Our youth today have this trend where what? That for example, when they decide to become religious, okay, what do they do? They start praying. And they stop listening to music. I'm just going to throw that in there. But when they stop wanting to be religious, what do they do? They stop praying and they start listening to music. So we see that Salah is often enough used when we want to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the importance and the power of Salah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has told us that this Salah, it will prevent you. This is what Allah is saying in the Quran. I'm not saying to you that yes, it's going to stop you from indecencies. And evil acts, Allah is saying to you that your salah will stop you from indecencies. It will prevent you from indecencies and committing evil acts and wrong actions. So let us have a look at another verse in the Holy Quran regarding. Oh, before I get to that, actually, I just remembered. This is why you have notes in front of you sometimes. Okay? So in Arabic, when you go to a mosque and the place where you pray, what is it called? Mahrab. Okay? Everyone heard of this? Mahrab? Okay, great. Mahrab comes from the word harb, which means. Why is this the case? Because when you are praying, you are at war with those distractions, with the shaitan. Because the shaitan, he wants to do anything to distract you from salah. For example, in Surah Al Ma'idah, number 5, verse number 91. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put for us a verse, you know, an example. He says, he talks about intoxicants, alcohol, and gambling. Now, I'm not going to talk about gambling and, and alcohol, but what I'm going to say is this. Right? He says that the shaitan uses these to prevent people from salah. The shaitan. 
The shaitan wants to do anything to prevent you from salah. Why? Because this salah is your key to success. The salah is your key to success. It will prevent you from the indecencies. It will prevent you from doing the fahisha and the munkar. And as we had said in the first nights, when we spoke about taqwa, the key essence to taqwa is what? To avoid sins. And the main tool that we need to avoid sins is our salah. Because that salah, what does it do? It burns any barriers between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell me now, how is it that you see your salah? When we start to look at it like this. Similarly, let's look at another aspect of salah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us in another verse. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'abaduni Another reason why we pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the importance of it, is that when we, now when we say, Now, aqim comes from the word in Arabic, qiyam. Now that means when you hold something, steadfast, upright. So let's give an example from the Quran again. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوام سبحان الله Surely this Quran guides to that which is most upright and Allah tells us what to do with our prayers to make our prayers upright سبحان الله You see Salah it's got every angle covered سبحان الله Every angle Salah has a cover and then we need to ask ourselves again and again, why do we neglect our salah? Why do we not pay attention to our salah? Why do we not focus to in our salah? Why is our salah something that is, you know, it's all the way back there. That we don't plan our days around salah. We don't think to ourselves, okay, hold on a second. Okay, salah is in half an hour. Okay, I need to be somewhere in an hour. Yeah, I can pray and make it. Yeah. Oh, if I can't make it, oh, yes, I know. Yep, yep, there's somewhere to pray there. We don't think like this. Imam Ali alayhi salam he narrates about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alim, that when it comes to salah it's as if the Prophet had no family or knew no friend. This is how important salah was. Now when someone like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alim, right, the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khatim al anbiya wal Mursaleen. Now he is in a higher status than all of us. But yet when it comes to Salah, nothing stops him from performing his prayers. Surely this is a message. We need that Salah so much because that Salah is going to do what? It's going to burn things that is a barrier between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So another aspect of our Salah is for dhikrullah. So that we are always in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةَ فَأَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقْعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِكُمْ And if you uphold the prayers, remember Allah standing and sitting and reclining. This is the effect of your salah, brothers and sisters. This connection with Allah So now that we see our salah is a way to burn or to get rid of that barriers between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It stops us from committing indecencies and evil acts from sinning. It also is what is also a means of remembrance and always keeping remembrance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else does our salah do? So in Surah Al-Baqarah, and uh, you know this was, in, in thinking about this, when I was writing this, there are so many verses and so many narrations regarding Salah. You don't know where to start, you don't know where to end, you don't know what to talk about. So it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ Seek assistance through patience and prayer. And most surely is a hard thing except for the humble ones. In another place, Allah is telling us that when we need assistance, one of the ways for us to seek assistance is through Salah. Subhanallah. How many benefits does Salah have? Tell me when we look at it like this, tell me how important is your Salah now? 
that this salah benefits you in so many different ways, shape or form. Whether it be through the way of singing, whether it be through the way of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be seeking assistance, the salah is there. Also we see within the Holy Quran, there is a dua by Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now as you know Nabi Ibrahim, Nabi Allah Ibrahim, the champion of monotheists. Nabi Ibrahim, when he was at a very old age, right? He was gifted with two sons, with Ismail and Ishaq. Right now, can you imagine you've waited your whole life to have these sons? So, what is the dua which Nabi Allah Ibrahim السلام, makes when thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Surah Ibrahim regarding the giving of his son? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-Ladhi wahaba li ala al-Kibri Ismail wa Ishaq. Inna Rabbi la Samiru dua. Then he says, Rabbi ij'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua'i. Subhanallah. It's, he's not young here in Nabi Allah Ibrahim. Right? He's an old man. And look at the dua he's making. Oh Allah! Keep, help me what? He's making, make me keep up the prayer. Hold that prayer standing it upright. Look at the word again, muqeem. Comes from the word? Qiyam. Look at this dua by Nabi Ibrahim. How much do we care about our salah that we ask oh Allah? Help me so I can be muqeem as salah. Why? Because this salah has so many benefits. Why else would the Ahlul Bayt say to us that this is Amud al Deen? Why else would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us know through the Ahlul Bayt that if your salah is not right on the Day of Judgment, nothing is right. Because this salah is the key to everything. It's mentioned so much in the Quran. It is a success for the believers. It is everything that we need to succeed and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in our salah. So this is the importance of our Salah brothers and sisters. We cannot stress this enough. It cannot be stressed. When next time you read through the Quran, when you look at about the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt regarding Salah, you come to understand and inshallah, this love for salah, this love for wanting to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this love for wanting to destroy any barriers between us and Allah will slowly increase. And the barriers, inshallah, will slowly wither away. Also, there is a beautiful, beautiful hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi regarding salah. He says, as long as you are praying, know that verily you are knocking at the door of the Almighty King. And the King's door opens for whoever knocks persistently thereat. So you're praying, you're constantly at the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're knocking on the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you keep knocking, and if you keep knocking, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to turn you away? Do you think He's going to turn you away? No way, you're coming to Him with your salah. And through this, brothers and sisters, tonight what I wanted to highlight, because there were more verses regarding salah, there are more hadith regarding salah, but you know, we could be here for a while narrating verse after verse and hadith after hadith regarding salah. But the point is that we need to realize and we need to have it set within our hearts, not just within our minds. Because you need to be passionate about a certain thing if you want to achieve it, right? And our passion in life should always be striving to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we don't really strive for that nearness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we strive for something else, something temporary, something that really isn't going to satisfy us, right? While they sing salah, you will always want to increase your satisfaction. You always strive hard to increase your satisfaction. Well, there are things you may be satisfied with and it's not going to really benefit you. 
For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says in regards to his salah, he said, salah for like me, for me is like a thirsty man when he is thirsty. A man who wants water while he is thirsty. Or a hungry man when he wants food. Except when you are thirsty and you drink, your thirst will be quenched. When you are hungry and you eat, your hunger will become satisfied. But when I am in salah, nothing can satisfy my yearning to what? To get close to Allah Azza wa Jal. Nothing can satisfy that. There's always that wanting to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why shouldn't we, brothers and sisters? And why shouldn't we? Because if we don't do this to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we don't burn these diseases within us and get rid of all these barriers between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we may find ourselves in a predicament. We might find ourselves starting to carry negative traits. We may start find ourselves starting to carry all these vices, destroying those virtues that we have within us. And this is why that salah is so important for us. Because that salah will purify us, inshaAllah. And you know, we need to be purified because you never know to what levels a human being can reach. The human being can reach the lowest of lows sometime. The human being could come to such a state where they will do unthinkable crimes. They will commit tragedies which no human has ever heard of before. And tonight, I'd like to speak to you about Ali al-Azghar, the son of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Ali al-Azghar, the grandchild of Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayha, the grandchild of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Now, what happens in the plains of Karbala? Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, at this point, all his companions and all his Ahlul Bayt were killed and he was left alone. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he asks Zainab to bring him his baby Abdullah and as well to call the mother Al Rabab because he wants to say goodbye to his son Abdullah. Now Abdullah Radiya Ali al Azhar, he's six months old, he's just a baby. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, he is sitting there in front of the tent and he's kissing his baby and he says away with these people when your grandfather the chosen one sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is their opponent that he's telling his child that these people who are there they're the opponents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi now tell me what does a father do in hope for his six month old baby what does a father do when his baby hasn't had any water or any milk for three days? So he takes his baby and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he goes towards the lines of the enemy. He approaches the lines of the enemy and he says to them, he says, oh man, oh soldiers, if you have a problem with me, then you, are, you can come for me. But what is the crime of this six month old baby? This six month old baby, oh won't you just quench his thirst? So Imam Hussain alayhi salam, he has Abdullah al radiyah he has Ali al azhar in his hand. And then all of a sudden, there is some bickering and there's some argument amongst the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad. Some of them are saying, why don't you quench the thirst, he is just an innocent baby. While others of them are saying, no, none of them shall taste any water. None of them shall taste any water until they taste the boiling water of hellfire. Can you imagine that people that reached such a point where they were arguing of whether to feed a six month old baby some water after they had been without any water and milk for some time? So all of a sudden these men they continue arguing amongst themselves. Do they kill the baby or do they give the baby water? All of a sudden that La'in Amr ibn Sa'ad he turns to Harmala. He says to Harmala, oh Harmala, would you sort out this issue? Would you stop the arguing between the soldiers? All of a sudden Al Harmala, what does he do? He doesn't pull out a normal arrow. He wants to be more vicious than that. He wants to be more barbaric than that. So he pulls out a three-headed arrow. He pulls out a three-headed arrow. At that point, what catches his eye is the radiant neck of Ali al-Azhar. 
It catches his eye the radiant neck of Ali al Azgar. So he points the arrow to the neck of Ali al Azgar. While Ali al Azgar is in the hands of his father, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Remember, this is the progeny of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This is the progeny of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ali. So Harmalahi shoots that arrow towards the neck of Ali al Azgar. It strikes Ali al Azgar right in the neck. And at this point, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he is covered in the blood of Ali al Azgar. The summer the narrations tell us that he picked up that blood and he threw it to the heavens and it never came back down. At this point, what does a father do? What crime did Ali al Azhar commit? What crime does he commit? He takes Ali al Azhar and the narrations tell us that he buries him alongside the other martyrs of Karbala. And then we have some other narrations that tell us even after the battle, some of these vicious people they look for the body of Ali al Azhar to decapitate his head and place it on a spear. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Wa sayalamu alladheena adhalamu ayya man qalbin ya qalibun Wa al-aqibatu ulil mutsaqeen Rahimallah makara asulat al-fatiha masbukatan bis salati ala muhammad wa ala muhammad Thank you Had Thank you, Hajj Ghanib, for illuminating the way for us. And inshallah, we will work on incorporating those important points into our lives. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Hajj Talib on behalf of all of us for his tireless efforts. He has sacrificed much not only to prepare and give these great talks, but also to prepare and organize behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of these programs and he's often rushed straight from work to here <coughs> to make sure that everything is set up for these uh, 10 nights so may Allah reward you Hajji Talib for all your efforts with the highest rewards in this life and in the next a few announcements, uh, brothers and sisters. It is very ironic that we are talking about a massacre where a drop of water was precious. And night after night, brothers and sisters, we are leaving bottles of water that are half drunken. Please. Please, if you have opened a bottle of water, please take it home with you, please. Tomorrow morning's joint Ashura program begins at 8.30 at La Mirage. Uh, I believe I've been told I've not been there before. It is on Hume Highway, uh, Craigieburn. Um, please ensure you get a full address from someone else. It is at 8.30 though. Um, and we have our final 10th program tomorrow night here. We will have a full program commencing at Maghrib prayers. Please join us. It will be a full program as per usual. And our programs have been uploaded online on YouTube. Please do watch them and share them. And we would like to thank once again the Humanitarian Dialogue Foundation for opening up their doors and allowing us to use their venue for 10 nights in a row. If you do um, have the ability, please do donate for their cause. Uh, boxes are available up front. And uh, a reminder that um, Beacon of Hope do have a Friday night program every Friday right here in this venue, commencing at Maghrib prayers. Um, so please feel free to inform others who aren't here. And we will complete our program tonight with ziyara of our beloved Imam. And if we could have our um, brother Hashim join us with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, please attend to the Qibla. Sorry, 
just before I begin, I've just been given the full address. So it's Lama Raj, 210 Hume Highway, Somerton, Victoria. 210 Hume Highway, Somerton, Victoria, at 8.30 a.m. أزور سيدي ومولاي ومحتمدي ورجاي ذخري وذخيرتي بعبد الله الحسين عليه السلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا وارث آدم صفوة الله السلام عليك يا وارث نوح النبي الله السلام عليك يا وارث إبراهيم خليل الله السلام عليك يا وارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك يا وارث عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا وارث محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارث أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام السلام عليك يا ابن محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أنك قد أقمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وأعطعت الله ورسوله حتى أتاك اليقين فلعن الله أمة قتلت ولعن الله أمة ظلمت ولعن الله أمة سمعت بذلك فرضيت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مدلهمات ثيابها وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك الإمام البر التقي الرضي الزكي الهادي المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة من ولدك كلمة التقوى وأعلام الهدى والعروة الوثقى والحجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله وملائكته وأنبياءه ورسله إني بكم مؤمن وبيا بكم موقن بشرائع ديني وخواتيم عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سلم وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى أرواحكم وعلى أجسادكم وعلى أجسامكم وعلى شاهدكم وعلى غائبكم وعلى ظاهركم وعلى باطنكم بأبي أنت وأمي يا ابن رسول الله بأبي أنت وأمي يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل السماوات والأرض فلعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتهيأت لقتالك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله قصدت حرمك وأتيت إلى مشهدك أسأل الله بالشأن الذي لك عنده وبالمحل الذي لك لديه أن يصلي على محمد وآل محمد وأن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على Uh, for, the, for the brothers, inshallah, the uh, food's at the front, inshallah. Huh? Yeah. yeah.